I've been getting a lot of questions about LSAT logic games lately from students who are having struggles with this section. And then when I ask them how many games they've done, they'll say something like 20 or 30 or the 40 in one of those books of 10 exams. And that to me is just a drop in the bucket because there are nearly 400 LSAT logic games available for you to study from using past LSAT exams. And so if you truly wanted to master logic games, if you wanted to perfect them, why wouldn't you do every single logic game ever released? If you did that, you would start to better see the patterns underlying different game types, and you would ensure that there was nothing new under the sun that they could possibly throw at you. Now you might sit, point out that some of these games are hard to get your hands on, some of them are out of print, that's true, but the vast majority are easily accessible to you. Most of them are available in Books of Ten on Amazon for around 20 bucks each. So you could master the simple games like the ordering games, the grouping games, then the tougher combination games. Then you could take it to the next level by working on the rare unfamiliar game types like mapping, pattern, circle games, and then even those weirder games that don't, leaf, don't neatly fit into any particular category. I have a list of those weird curveball logic games on my site, and you could run through those covering from exam number one all the way up to the present. That would be a good starting point. If you just focused on that list after you had already built a strong foundation, there would be nothing new under the sun to you. And so to me, if you want a foolproof method to master in logic games, it's as simple as doing every game ever released. Then the ones that give you the most trouble, do them again and again and again to find more efficient methods. And if it's still giving you trouble, then look up explanations, either written or video, but don't use those as a crutch because those are simply one person's perfect way of doing the game. Oftentimes they've already seen the game before, so that isn't even necessarily how they might have done it had they seen it for the first time. However, that could still sh shed some light for you on how to approach that game and give you some new tools in your toolkit to bring out whenever you encounter a new unfamiliar game. I see students making this mistake again and again and again where they'll get a logical reasoning question wrong, they'll check the answer key, they'll say, oh, I get it now, and then they'll move on. Or even worse, they'll look at an explanation or watch an explanation, say, I get it now, how could I have been so dumb, then they move on. The thing is, if you can't explain in your own words why you got it wrong, you are doomed to making the same mistake again. When you're reviewing a logical reasoning question, what you've got to do is first, check where your misunderstanding stemmed from. Was it in the stimulus? Was it in the question stem? Or was it in the answer choices? If it was in the stimulus, paraphrase the stimulus, put it in your own words, and look specifically for what made the stimulus so difficult for you. Where was your misunderstanding? Was it finding the conclusion, the premises, filler, counter premise, sub conclusion? In other words, was it something about the structure of the stimulus or was it the topic? Was it that things were out of order? Was it that they used the word unless? Was it that they were lacking conditional indicator words or evidence and conclusion indicators? You've really got to dissect it and come to see the stimulus from the test maker's point of view, because there could be three or four or five things about the stimulus that independently make it difficult. And when you put them all together, you make an especially difficult logical reasoning question. So that's the mistake I often see students making where they'll read the stimulus, they'll be confused by it, then they'll go on to the answer choices in hope those will clear it up, when in fact, the answer choices only serve to further confuse you and complicate things because the choices only make sense in the context of the stimulus. So first step is dissecting the stimulus as part of your review process. Next, you want to see if there was something about the question type in the question stem that confused you. LSAC has been remarkably sneaky about presenting common question types in an unfamiliar way especially in the more recent exams, those published in the last 10 years or so. So those in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and so on, are typically more confusingly worded than those in the 40s and prior. 
So make sure that you know exactly what they're asking you to do. And then if your mistake was in the answer choices, you want to see what was tempting about the wrong answer that made you pick it and what ultimately made it wrong and what was discouraging about the right answer that pushed you away from it and what ultimately makes it correct. This takes time to spot those traps of encouragement towards the wrong answer and traps of discouragement away from the right answer. This is a, this is a painstakingly slow process, but it's worth investing the time. If you really want to perfect logical reasoning, if you really want to master and foolproof this section, you've got to dissect every aspect of the question. And this means, yeah, you won't be able to review as many questions and you won't be able to complete as many questions. I'll have students come to me and say, if I went through this process for every question that gave me trouble, I wouldn't be able to do three exams a week or four exams a week or even worse every single day. And my response is, well, then don't do that many exams per week. You're better off doing one or two per week and reviewing them in more detail than doing a greater number of questions, but only covering them on a surface level. If you just do exam after exam and measure your results, you're going to keep making the same mistakes again and again. The point of doing these questions is not to simply measure yourself. It's to make mistakes so that you can review them specifically. I actually want you to make mistakes. I actually want you to get questions wrong because that's the only way to learn from them and to avoid making the same mistakes again. This exam is a test of pattern recognition. It's not a test of simply how many questions you can do. I'd rather you do fewer exams and review them in more depth than do several more and review them on a surface level. I see a lot of students getting overly wrapped up in the details on LSAT reading comprehension. And I think this is a huge mistake, in part because you know for a fact they're going to ask you, what's the main point? What's the author's opinion? What's the primary purpose of the passage? Something along those lines. I see students instead getting obsessed with capturing all the little details, all the lists of things, all the supporting evidence and things of that nature, which you can go back to it and find it when you need to. And chances are, even if you thoroughly take the time to digest it, you won't remember it by the time you get to the questions anyway. You'll either forget it or you'll run out of time. So my solution instead is simply try to walk away from the passage with the main idea, with, these, with the author's opinion, with the primary purpose. To me, that is a foolproof method for tackling at least a couple of questions in the passage. And students will ask me, should I save those for last? My answer is absolutely not. Those are the easiest questions. Those are the gimmies. And if you can't solve the question of what the main idea is after reading the passage, then to me, you really got nothing from the passage at all. So walk away with the major viewpoints. You can make little notes on your scratch paper if you want to, to simply list them a couple of keywords, but the details know where to find them when you need them but don't get bogged down in thoroughly interpreting that very complex text in the moment. You can always go back to the passage. You can always find that information later when you need it. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.